Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. I'd like to present a few facts uh, for your consideration and just let you make up your own mind whether you think Samson is a type of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Samson. This is one of the most famous stories of the Old Testament. Samson judged Israel for 20 years. Uh, he lived in the first half of the 11th century. And uh, his, his death occurred in a specific location, which is basically no mystery. It's, it's, uh, uh, you can easily confirm uh, the location, and that would be Gaza. I find that interesting given everything that's going on in the, the war in the Middle East. So that, that kind of factors into this. So I hope you find this video interesting. Just think uh, the current war in Gaza and just hold that thought as we go through these, uh, these facts. He died in a region uh, which hasn't been excavated. The ancient ruins of the city and its temple lie underneath the present rubble uh, from the, the current war that's taking place. Uh, in searching for its location uh, in the past, four, four locations, four temples have been found. Uh, four temples all in the region of the ancient Philistines. Now, the Philistines, according to most Bible scholars, not, not everyone is in agreement with this, but according to most Bible scholars, the, the current day, the present day Palestinians are the ancestors, or the Philistines were the ancestors of the current day Palestinians. And so these temples were all found in, that, in this region. Uh, they went searching for evidence of, of these temples, which would have had to have had uh, two central pillars supporting the roof. Because the, these pillars are what Samson pushed against to cause the temple to collapse. One uh, in 1972 uh, from the 11th century BC was uncovered near Tel Aviv. Two more temples that would actually qualify were discovered at ancient Ekron. I'm going to put a map up here for you to look at. Uh, dated to between 1100 BC and, and, and 1000 BC. Uh, but before or during Samson's lifetime. And a fourth one was excavated in the region. Ekron is mentioned in the Bible in Joshua's uh, chapters 13, 15, and 19, the Ark of the Covenant was there for a time, according to 1 Samuel chapters 5 and 6. Uh, one is ancient Goth, uh, the hometown of the most famous Philistine, Goliath. We learn that from 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17. The Ark of the Covenant also resided for a time in, in, in Goth or Gath, uh, and, it, and it, along with Ashdod, Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron. That's the red area here on the map. Uh, So these areas, Ashdod, uh, uh, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ekron, one of the five most important Philistine cities of, of the Philistines was in this area. Uh, the temple's dated to the ninth century, so it's later than Samson, that, the, fourth, the fourth one, but it's more evidence of, of these structures with two central pillars uh, in conjunction with the other three examples that did exist before or during Samson's lifetime. So this is the region wherein the account of Samson's death occurred. 
in short, I guess what I'm trying to say is Samson, his death and the temple that collapsed as a result of, of Samson's actions occurred right in the area in which the fighting is taking place today. Now, this video came about as a result of, of my researching the Samson option. It's, it's something I've been interested in for a, a long time. Uh, many of you know what that is. The Samson option led me to what I'm calling the Samson pattern. Now, as many do, I believe that Samson is a type of Christ. You'll have to make up your own mind on that. Uh, and I believe this is relevant to every age, including Daniel's 70th week and the kingdom. Now, there was a news report at the end of June which sparked my interest, which really got, got me to thinking about this. Iran basically said to Israel, you attack Lebanon and Israel will be exterminated. Israel responded back to Iran saying, well, we have the doomsday weapon. And they call that the Samson option. So here I am, I'm seeing this saber rattling, you know, between Iran and Israel after Gaza has been decimated and the number of, of casualties of the war continue to, to rise. Samson option. Now, who named it that? Well, you could argue there was some Israeli commander or you know, a high-ranking high military planner that came up with that, that name. I'm going to argue God named it that. And I'd like to, for you to keep in mind God's sovereignty as we go through all of this. I'm sure you, many of you remember Samson. Uh, you know, sacrifice yourself to defeat your enemies. You know, kind of like what Christ did on the cross. So there's our first indication that there may be a pattern there. Sacrifice yourself to defeat your enemies, like what Christ did on the cross. Now, in Daniel's 70th week, otherwise known as the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation period, we know Israel's population will be drastically redu reduced. We know that. Yet, yet Israel's enemies will be utterly decimated. So there seems to be more evidence of a pattern here, which actually has to do with the tribulation period. Is Samson a pattern of Jesus Christ? That's the question of this video. Now, some Christians view him as a type of Jesus based on similarities between their lives. Samson's and Jesus' births uh, were both foretold by angels uh, who predicted that they would save or deliver uh, their people. There seems to me, at least to me, to be no doubt that we are intended to see Samson as a type of Christ. All the judges in some way prefigured the Lord because they were saviors, quote unquote. They were saviors raised up to deliver God's weak and failing pe people in pure grace when it, according to God's own word, they should have received the due punishment of rejection, Nehemiah chapter 9. Now, in speaking of Christ, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15, we read, He who delivered, who delivered them, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Well, we see that Christ Jesus was typified by all those earlier deliverers of God's people from bondage. So, the deliverance which the Lord achieved was foreshadowed by the great deliverance brought about by Samson, uh, which I'm going to say includes the deliverance of God's people in Daniel's 70th week because the, the, the pattern 
spreads out through all of human history. Now, I think Samson would have known about Jesus possessing the gate of his enemies when Samson took away the gates of Gaza. I think he saw himself in some sense as one who could do what the promised seed would do. Uh, there are obvious things which make Samson a type of Christ. The birth of both of them was foretold by an angel, and, and that at a time when Israel had been handed over to their enemies. The record of Samson's birth frequently uses the phrases the man and the woman as if to send our minds back to Eden uh, with the implication that Samson was the seed of the woman in type of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The woman is a phrase nearly always associated in Scripture with the birth of someone who was to be a seed of the woman. Both of them married uh, uh, Gentiles. You could say, you know, Christ married to the church. Uh, both were betrayed by pieces of silver. That's interesting. Now we have Judas sort of coming into the picture. I think Judas, personally, I think she's... Uh, Delilah is a picture of Judas. The supreme strength and courage of Samson in fighting and killing the lion points forward to Christ destroying our adversary, the devil, which is likened to a roaring lion, 1 Peter chapter 5. As I said earlier, Samson means the sun. Uh, I've, I've mentioned this in, in previous videos. That ties together nicely with the Lord's title as the Son of Righteousness in Malachi chapter 4. The incident in Gaza is evidently typical of the Lord's work. There was Samson, the splendor of the sun, uh, compassed in by his enemies, just as Christ was on the cross. Psalms 118. I believe we'd have to say that the incident in Gaza, what's taking place, the war in the Middle East, it's all that is evidently the Lord's work. So there he was in Gaza. Now Samson arose, the text says, in the darkness, and he rendered powerless the gates of death. Sounds like what, you know, Calvary, Christ. His crucifixion, His redeeming us. It's what Christ did on the cross. He carried those gates 30 miles up to a high altitude. Well, I, that makes me think of heaven. Uh, to Hebron, the, uh, the city of fellowship. Hebron, the city of fellowship which happens to be where the tomb of Abraham was, according to Genesis chapter 23, and where Gentile giants had once lived, according to Numbers chapter 13, giants conquered by Israelites. The Hebrew uh, used for Samson taking away the gates is translated possess in the Genesis promises. So he, he possessed the gates of his enemies and he slew their figureheads just as the Lord did through the cross. Uh, and as Christ will do when he returns. I think Samson obviously saw some specific meaning in taking the gates uh, to Hebron and the tomb of Abraham. He surely saw that he was prefiguring Messiah's work of taking the gate of his enemies as promised to Abraham, a type of what Christ would do in the future, uh, archaeologists have found tablets that refer to the power of Baal uh, to possess the gates of all who oppose him. And Samson evidently wanted to show the superiority of Yahweh over Baal. There are other points of connection with the Lord's crucifixion. The men of Gaza laid wait in the gates of the city, says the text but they decided to only kill him in the morning. 
the rulers of the Jews decided likewise. Samson at his death was Samson at his finest, and this was true of the Lord. That makes him a type of Christ. The way that he was betrayed for silver by the one he trusted is an obvious link with the Lord's experience. The way he died with such a deep, deep sense of betrayal typifies the Lord. Why did Samson go on loving Delilah when it was so obvious that she was going to betray him? Their offer of money to Delilah, to Delilah to her was, was exactly after the pattern of the Jews' approach to Judas. Uh, the way that that phrase, pieces of silver, the way that that features in both records leads me to wonder whether she also uh, betrayed Samson with a kiss just as Judas did. I, I tend to try not to read too much between the lines, but it is suggested in Samson and Delilah that her betrayal of Samson was done in the spirit of some kind of loving, playful teasing. That's kind of the, the feeling I got as I was reading through the text. She started to afflict Samson and had the better of him. Uh, she may well have betrayed him with a kiss as she called the Philistine warriors in. We can reason on and consider how she, she like Judas, would have avoided eye contact, how Samson would have looked at her with a pain and disbelief and disappointment that it's beyond words, and how she, as, as Judas, must have lived a wretched life afterwards until her death. In looking at Proverbs chapter 6 and, and the beginning of chapter 7, uh, we see a clear allusion to Samson and Delilah. Delilah and they suggest that Delilah, Delilah was a uh, prostitute. Uh, in this case, her motivation for betraying Samson was fundamentally financial apart from other lesser factors, which there probably were. And Judas likewise went to the chief priests and asked how much that they would give him for betraying the Lord. Uh, con just consider the Lord's relationship with Judas. He knew from the beginning who should betray him. He knew that the one with whom he shared a closeness would betray him. Psalms chapter 55. Now, if these connections are valid, and it seems to me that they are, then we see in the account, we see in the account the resurrection, judgment, final deliverance of God's people. Exactly uh, how it all consummates in the tribulation period. Now, Paul, he also has plenty of these references in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Why are, are, are there these Samson references in a prophecy of the Lord's betrayal? Surely he was a type of Christ. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, in, concerning Jesus, through death he destroyed him that had the power of death. This is exactly the idea, you know, uh, of Judges uh, chapter 16, verse 30. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he, he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life, says the text. So through his own death, Christ destroyed the power of sin and we have a lot of dead Philistines here in the account of Samson. Hebrews chapter 2, Christ delivered them through fear of who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, that's packed with allusions to the time of the judges, uh, Israel in hard bondage to their Philistine masters living in fear until judges or, or deliverers like Samson delivered them from their oppressors. The same great relief which Israel felt after Samson's deliverances of them can be experienced by us spiritually the, the sins, the doubts, the fears which we all have as we analyze our own spiritual standing ought to melt away when we recall the great deliverance which our brothers and sisters 
in Christ have received. The Jews, folks, wanted the Lord's death because they saw Him as their destroyer. And the Philistines likewise. The way that they mocked Samson uh, links with how the, the Lord was mocked. The Philistines didn't kill Samson immediately. They wanted to prolong the agony of his death. It was evidently their intention to kill him. And Samson d dying between the two pillars is similar to the Lord's death between two other crosses. Now the text is Samson bowing himself in the Hebrew, that's stretching himself out to his full extension with all his spiritual and physical energy. To me, that pictures our Lord stretched out on the cross. The way that the body was taken up by brave Israelites after Samson's death reminds me of the compassion of of Joseph and Nicodemus on the body of Jesus. There is reason to think that to some degree Samson would have appreciated all this, that he was a type of Christ. Samson may have recognized the strength of the future Savior when he gave his riddle to the Philistines. He meditated upon that dead lion with the sweet honey in it, and he formulated his comment, what is sweeter than honey? What or, or who is stronger than a lion? Uh, in Hebrew, the, that's the strong one. Who is stronger than the strong one? Was, was an idea picked up by the Lord Jesus in, uh, I suggest, a, a conscious illusion. Uh, Matthew 12, chapter 12. Uh, it's kind of masked in the English text. But he was the strong one who was stronger than the strong man of sin. Through his victory, the, ro the roaring lion of the devil lays dead, and in his skull is sweet honey. Did Samson see in this the same meaning as David did in Psalm 119? Did he so understand the nature and the method of the Lord's work that he appreciated that the Lord's victory over all his people's enemies would be through the power of God's Word lying there in the place of the mind of the beast that he overcame? Yet Samson killed the lion himself, Surely he felt that to some degree he was the strong man who had overcome the beast through his application to God's Word. Often he makes reference to God's past revelation, both in his words and actions. That would indicate that he was a man of the Word, and yet despite this, he fell so miserably. Uh, You know, it's, uh, but I'm looking at chapter 16 and verse 32 and chapter, chapter 25, verse 28. S Solomon, evidently, Solomon writes with allusion uh, uh, to Samson. Uh, here was a man who loved God's word and yet he went so astray with women. And tragically enough, Solomon himself did just the same. That's interesting. He mourned the tragedy of Samson as a lover of the Word who fell for the Gentile woman, and then with all of his wisdom, he did the very same thing. It's, it's always by grace, folks. It's always by grace. We come to an appreciation of, of Christ, of our own sinfulness and His saving grace, and of our desperation for His salvation. So we can clearly see in the textual account Christ, uh, Israel, and her enemies, uh, the tribulation period, the final deliverance, I believe. Uh, let me ask you this. Who doubts that the tribulation period will see nuclear weapons used in the Middle East? I think there are allusions to that in Revelation. Uh, the, as, I, as I mentioned, Samson is derived from the Hebrew word which means son, S-U-N. 
so that Samson bore the name of God who was called a son and a shield in Psalms 84. And you can even see this in the story of Samson's birth. It parallels Jesus' birth in some remarkable ways. Both were promised miraculously before their birth. Both were answers to Israel's bondage. Both stories skip straight from birth to adulthood, skipping their childhoods. And just as God protected Israel, so did Samson watch over it in his generation, judging the people even as, as God did. Samson was the last of the judges of the ancient Israelites mentioned in the book of Judges. The last. He was one of the last leaders who judged Israel before the institution of the monarchy, that is, kings. You know, God, you know, as you know, God gave Israel judges and he gave them kings. So he was one of the last leaders who judged Israel before uh, the monarchy was, was instituted. The biblical account states that Samson was a Nazarite, an, uh, an Israelite. A Nazarite is one consecrated to the service of God. He was given immense strength to aid him against his enemies and allow him to perform uh, superhuman feats, including slaying a lion with his bare hands, mass massacring a, uh, a Philistine army with a donkey's jawbone. Uh, to me, that, that says no opponent was able to even touch him. Yeah, I think, it's, I think he is a, a type of Christ. Today, the, the Philistine people do not have their own country. The, the area in which they used to inhabit is what is now Israel and the Palestinian Gaza Strip. The uh, cutting of Samson's long hair would violate his Nazarite vow and nullify his ability, but Samson is betrayed by his uh, lover, now, think spiritual adultery here. Delilah, who was a Philistine, sent by Philistine officials to entice him, who orders a servant to cut his hair while he's sleeping and turns him over to the Philistines, who then gouge out his eyes and force him to mill grain at Gaza, says the text. And while there, his hair begins to grow again. And then when the Philistines take Samson into their temple of Dagon, that false god, we're looking at a false god here, ancient Syria, uh, in its early written history, the region was one that included modern day Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. Uh, Samson asks to rest against one of the support pillars after being granted permission. He, he prays to God miraculously recovers his strength, allowing him to bring down the columns, collapsing that false god temple, killing both himself and the Philistines. So to me, Samson appears to be not just a type of Christ's crucifixion, but our deliverer and the deliverer of Israel in the final days after the church is caught up and the tribulation period begins at which time Israel likely deploys its Samson option. I just find that interesting and thought I would pass that along. I hope you all are doing well. We love you here at Blessed Hope Forever. We love you. We truly do. Sue is on the mend. I uh, thank you for all, all your continued prayers. Please continue to pray for us in the direction of this ministry. Join us on Sunday as we study through the Epistle to the Galatians. We're moving into chapter 2. And until then, rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.